Hello, welcome to Free Bible Commentary with Pastor Teacher Dr. Bob Utley. Be sure to visit Free Bible Commentary at www.freebiblecommentary.org. Now, here's Bob. Jeremiah chapter 8 is somewhat of a difficult chapter to try to teach because it's a kind of a summary or uh, eclectic kind of chapter following chapter 7, which is the temple message. And the, this seems to be kind of a collection of Jeremiah's sayings. We're not sure of what particular time he spoke this or what the occasion might have been. Uh, but it's obvious, again, he's talking about the unrepentant nature of Judah, the enemy that's coming from the north, and his personal struggle with why, when they hear the truth, why don't they respond? And um, the last part of chapter 8 is, it can almost be, when I read it, I just, I, it just, I almost felt like sobbing when you read 18 and following of how Jeremiah's heart was broken over the message he had to proclaim and the, the way the message was received. It, it just, it overwhelmed him what was coming and how complacent the people were in their sin. Well, let me read 1 through 3. Many think it goes with the last chapter, but it's very interesting in what it says, and so I think you need to follow with me. At that time, declares the Lord, I will bring out the bones of the kings of Judah and the bones of its princes and the bones of its priests and the bones of its prophets and the bones of the inhabitants of Jerusalem from their graves. And they will spread them out to the sun, the moon, and all the host of heaven, which they have loved and which they have served, which they have gone after, and which they have sought and which they have worshipped. And they will not be gathered or buried. They will be as dung on the face of the ground. And death will be chosen rather than life by all the remnant that remains of this evil family that remains in all the places to which I have driven them, declares the Lord of hosts. Well, my word, what's happening here? It's as if God is bringing this enemy from the north to take and exile Judah for all her apostasy and wickedness. And one of them here is specifically mentioned, and that's the worship of astral deities. The ancients, and you can tell it happened very early, the Tower of Babel was nothing more than uh, ancient people being consumed with the stars and trying to reach God through inappropriate means. The ziggurats of Babylon that we've uncovered archaeologically were large pyramid-shaped things to get those people who watch the stars high up in the heavens uh, so they could see and observe and, and plan. And so the worship of stars is a, a common thing, even in the Bible. Back in the early parts of the Pentateuch, um, Deuteronomy 4.19 says, Leave them alone. Don't go after them. Don't worship them. Uh, they were believed that all the stars and planets were deities. Whether they're angels or pantheon deities, we're not sure. But they control the lives of men. I think a good balancing statement in the Bible is found in Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 6, where Nehemiah prays, Thou art the Creator. Thou hast made the stars and put them in their place. They're not separate powers in biblical thought. They are, God's the one that threw the stars into space in creation. God controls them. They're not separate deities that guide men's lives. And yet, how Israel loved to worship the sun, the moon, the stars, and all the host of heaven, which means the planets and the other heavenly bodies. Now, when it says that they're going to be, their bones are going to be dug up and spread out, I think there's three possibilities here, and I'm not sure which it is. So let me just think through it with you and see what you think. Number one... I think they might have been looking forward uh, to, well, they might have been looking for treasure buried with these people. You know, it uh, wasn't too long ago, uh, it was been five years, I was still in Fort Worth, and I heard on the news one day that a lady in Dallas had been married in her Maserati with the, with the radio on. She was sitting at the wheel, and they buried her in concrete so nobody would steal the car. Well, now, being married in, buried in your car is enough, but to leave the radio on, now, that, that's a strange lady. 
You know, uh, there was one time I used to do a lot of funerals for a, a, a funeral place in Fort Worth, and they had a, a, a gypsy funeral. The gypsy queen of Fort Worth died, and it was an elaborate burial. And they said they buried a whole lot of jewels with that lady and had to keep the grave secret so nobody would find the jewels and dig her up. That's what's happening here, maybe. Maybe they're after the things that people bury with their loved ones, jewelry, rings. Maybe that's when they dug them up. Or maybe they just really want to give the ultimate insult to a Jewish person was to remain unburied. One unburied body polluted the whole land, right? And so to be, even to be dug up later, we have, his, we have examples of that in interbiblical literature where the Arabs and the Jews would do that to one another. Well, maybe they just want to, to, to have a height of arrogance and hatred shown by doing this. Remember, Phil, when we were in the, on the Mount of Olives and looked down at that Jewish cemetery and old Uzi said that oh, this is the best place in Israel to be buried because the Jews buried here won't be the first ones up on resurrection morning. Well, you can imagine that kind of pious thought and someone coming there and throw your bones everywhere. The degradation that would have caused to family and hurt and animosity that, that expressed. Well, that's a possibility. Or I think maybe these, these ones that are coming, of course, the Babylon, Babylonians, they worship the astral deities. Maybe it was something to do with their worship of the astral deities. Or maybe it was God's ultimate uh, irony in saying, you've worshipped them, we'll just let your bones lie before them. You've committed yourself to them, let's see what they can do for you. And so one of those things were involved, but all the graves were opened up and the bones spread out. I had a friend who used to be a Old Testament and interbiblical professor at Southwestern. And he had Indian bones from all over South Texas, all, all kinds. Somebody said, you talk about a mess on resurrection morning. There's going to be more half Indians than this room you ever saw. And uh, that's, that's the picture here. Now, when it goes over to, um, notice the last part of verse 3 calls the, the name of God is the Lord of hosts. And we've called these deities the host of heaven. The word host is a very interesting Hebrew word. Some folk think it means these, this heavenly court or a reference to the armies, the host, of he, the host of heaven, the angelic army, or the host of Israel, the Israeli army. Um, it simply means, I don't know what it means when it's talking about God, but it seems to me to be God the captain of the army of heaven idea is how I usually interpret it. But the word has a whole lot of meanings like that. I want you to turn, I don't think you can understand verse 3 when it says that th these exiled Jews would choose death rather than what they were into, being taken captive and watching their temple be destroyed and Jerusalem raised. I guess one of the saddest psalms that I have ever read in my life, I want to read the first part to you. I don't want to tell you where it is after I read it because I don't want you to turn in there until afterwards. Let me read this to you. This is a psalm from Babylon. A psalm of the, that the Jewish people experienced as they were taken in captivity that Jeremiah is talking about when he says, By the canals of Babylon we sat down in deep grief when we remembered Zion. And upon the willows in the midst of it we hung our harps. For our captors demanded of us songs and our tormentors mirth saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. And the Jews answer, How can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its skill. May my tongue cleave the roof of my, my mouth. If I do not remember you, if I do not exalt you, Jerusalem, above my chief joy. And on and on it goes. You catch the anguish of that psalm? How can I sing the songs of Zion in a foreign place? Hung their harps upon the willows and could not sing. We do not understand what the exile was to the Jewish people who funneled every bit of their belief in the sacredness of the temple, that God was there, that they were the special people. Gone. Everything gone. Well, it's hard to imagine, but it happened. Now, beginning in verse 4, we start a series of poems. Now, where they break off and where they begin and what period they belong to is very hard to determine. As you know, I've told you before, Jeremiah is not a chronological, sequential book. It is extremely um, disjointed as far as time. Now, so let's look at verse 4 through 7. And you shall say to them, Thus saith the Lord, Do men fall and not get up again? Does one turn away and not repent? 
Why then has his people turned away? Jerusalem in constant apostasy or continual apostasy. They hold fast to deceit and they refuse to return. I have listened and heard and they have spoken what is not right. No man repented of his wickedness saying, What have I done? Everyone turned to his own course like a horse charging into battle. Even a stork in the sky knows her season, and the turtle dove and the swift and the thrush observe the time of their migration. But my people do not know the ordinance of the Lord. Ooh. Now this idea about, first of all, there's a word repent up there. This is a thematic word all the way through Jeremiah. Jeremiah plays on this word almost every chapter. It's the Hebrew word that's the consonant S-B. And it, it involves the idea of a turning around, a change of direction. Now, another Hebrew word is used here for repent in verse 6 when it says, No one has repented. And this is an onomatopoetic verb, that, a word that simply has a sound of someone breathing out. It's kind of a nesh. And uh, it involves the idea of great grief, great sorrow. And it's, it's that kind of word. Now, notice what he's saying here. This little phrase about last part of verse 4. Look in your translation. Somebody read me in King James the last phrase of verse 4. Real loud. Uh-huh. That was good. Okay, I didn't hear you, Opal. A little bit louder, can you? Okay, that shall he turn away and not return has really caused a lot of tr problems. The, gr the Hebrew here is a little bit ambiguous. Uh, Kim Chi, which is a Jewish commentator, translated it like this. If a man turns from evil, will not Yahweh turn from judgment? And yet a, a modern uh, classical writing on Judaism by a man named Moore translated it this way from his understanding of Judaism. If a man repent, he, God, will not repent. What it's saying is, that Moore is saying he's, that, that the verse means they've gone so far, they've done so much, they're so stiff-necked, they've come to the place it's impossible for them to repent. The other one is saying, if they ever will, God will, will forgive. Now, which it is, I don't really know, but we're getting, we're getting deeper and deeper into Jeremiah where Jeremiah is even losing the admonition to repent. He's just, he used to hit judgment if you don't. He, boy, pretty soon he's starting to hit judgment, period. And so I think probably God's saying, you've gone too far. You can't listen to me. Your prophets are bad. Your priests are bad. Your wise men are bad. You perverted my law. You don't care about me. You've gone after other idols and you've gone beyond the possibility. Isaiah 55, 6 says it quite well. Seek the Lord while he may be found. There comes a time after much sin and turning away in the presence of great light that repentance is impossible. We know it in the New Testament is what? The unpardonable sin. Now, um, when we skip down to verse 6, uh, you can almost hear Jeremiah saying, how can they do this? How, how can they... How can they have the Word of God and, and hear the preaching and, and still not turn away? And notice where it says in verse 6, God says, I think, I have listened and heard. He, he was listening for the prayers of a repentant person and didn't hear one prayer. They have spoken what is not right. No man repented of his wickedness. Now, you might want to turn back to Jeremiah chapter 5, 1 through 3, where it says, Roam to and throw through the streets of Jerusalem. Look now and take note and see in her open squares and find a man... If there is one who does justice and seek truth, and Jeremiah couldn't find one. Jeremiah couldn't find one man. For one man, the city would have been spared. It was even a greater grace than Sodom and Gomorrah, and they couldn't find one righteous person in the city of Jerusalem in Jeremiah's day for God to spare her. Um, now, notice where it says like a... Well, let me go down to verse 7. Here's where he's, he's saying, Starks. <laughs> Now, storks are migratory birds. I saw on a newsreel not re recently that there's so many storks in Israel right now, they're eating all the fish out of Isra Israeli fishing farms. <laughs> it's 
So they put up these, these guns that make these loud noises. You've heard them maybe in East Texas. They used to have them to keep foxes away from the turkeys. But uh, they just go bang every now and then. They're trying to, there's so many starks in Israel right now. They're cleaning out the fish farms. They're trying to scare them all away. The stark comes in in March to Israel. If Palestine is the place she comes for migration, she leaves in May. Now, a stark knows where to go and when to go. God has built into birds an unusual homing device that birds can travel thousands and thousands of miles and go back almost the same place they were born, right? And uh, he used this ideal against how God has built in innate knowledge in birds and said, birds know where to go when they should, but my people don't have the intelligence of birds. They don't know where to go. They don't know what's happening. That's a beautiful, be, can be compared with a stark and then lose. <laughs> now, all of these, these turtle doves, swift and thrust, these, these Hebrew terms are very ambiguous. You know, we want, we want the ancient books to be like us, and we want them to be accurate history. And, and when it talks about jewels in the Bible, we're not sure what jewels it's talking about. When it talks about trees and plants in the Bible, we're not always sure what trees and plants are talking about. When it talks about animals in the Bible, we're not always sure what animals they're talking about because in different times and different places, even among Semitic people, different animals had different names. So we're not sure exactly what birds are here, but that it's obvious the meaning. My people do not know the ordinances or laws or statutes of the Lord. Now, the word know in Hebrew is a very important word, isn't it? Is it mental knowledge? No. To know someone implies intimate personal relationship with. I've said it a million times. Adam knew Eve and she conceived. Well, that's the relationship with God and his people. That's why God can be called the husband of Israel. This word know speaks of intimate personal relationships. They may know the laws. They may be able to recite them. They may pray those scriptures on feast days. They may quote them in the temple. They may know the laws, but they don't know the lawgiver. That's what he's talking about. And if they do, they won't obey. That's the emphasis. Now, verse 8 down through 12. How can you say we are wise and the law of the Lord is with us? And behold, the lying pen of the scribes has made it a lie. The Jews were saying we have prophets. We have the law. We have Moses. We're the chosen people. We have the law of God. And so God, through Jeremiah, says, you think you're so hot, huh? You're so hot and you have all these advantages. And don't you realize that advantage brings responsibility? So look at this word, the lying pen of the scribe. This is, the word scribe is not used a whole lot until the later 8th century prophet's own. There's a, there's a couple of uses, but it seems like this is the first use of an official group known as... This is the Hebrew word sofer. We get the idea of the great synagogue and the great scribes during, after Ezra's day, known as the soferim. And that's the scribes. Now, what we have here, these scribes knew the law. They were official later on after Ezra and Nehemiah, because Ezra is called a scribe, an expert in the law. They are ones that interpreted the law to the people, apparently. What they had done is they had interpreted the law along the lines of the false prophets, saying, peace and security, God is in this place. We have the law. We have the tipple. No one will ever hurt us. And Jeremiah says, you're a fool. And you're going to captivity. Now, the wise men are to be put to shame. They are dismayed and caught. Behold, they have rejected the word of the Lord. Notice the play between the ordinances of the Lord in verse 7 and the word of the Lord in verse 9. They're, I think, linked. Uh, what kind of wisdom do they have? Therefore, I will give their wives to others and their fields to new owners. Girls, I hate to tell you this. This is a good example of the status of women in the Old Testament. Uh, you were listed before the field, but it's in the, you're in the same category. <laughs> Women in the Old Testament were treated as chattel. And I, it's so hard for us to understand. That's why the Bible must be interpreted in light of the universal principles and not as a culture of its day. Now, I don't think this verse at all would be appropriate in our day to say that wives are property to be used at the husband's discretion. Now, you have to realize the Old Testament lays a foundation that is somewhat cultural. 
And we have to interpret the Bible. You say, I don't believe that. Then why don't you keep the food laws? The Old Testament must be interpreted in light of the new. And the great emancipator of women is the Lord Jesus. I left a verse out up here a little earlier. I want to go back. Uh, these lying scribes, I think Jesus makes a little fun of them in Luke eleven fifty two. You might want to see that later. Now, notice where it says, Because the, the least, even to the greatest, everyone is greedy for grain. From the prophet to the priest, everyone practices deceit. These, these few verses in here are paralleled in chapter 6, verses 12 through 15, where Jeremiah says that the system is corrupt from the top to the bottom, and the whole thing's got to go. There isn't anybody in the system that's not corrupt. Now, notice verse 11. They heal the brokenness of the daughter of my people. That should be my daughter, my people. It's a synonymous name. English translation is very unfortunate like that. Superficially. Now, that goes back to this chapter 6. What he's saying is, Israel, excuse me, Judah has a fatal wound. But the skin has covered over the wound for a time. And everyone's saying, look, it's healed. But underneath, it's not healed. So the priests are saying, we've got good times. Nobody's here now. We're independent. Nobody's at our gates. And Jeremiah said, you've said there's no sickness, and I tell you the patient is about to die. That's the... They're saying peace and safety, everything's all right. And Jeremiah says, you are corrupt and you're going to die. Um, notice when it mentioned down in verse 12 about, therefore they shall fall among those who fall, talking about the leaders. What it's saying is, as the soldiers who defend Jerusalem die, so shall the civic leaders be put to the sword. Woo! And I'll tell you, you can't imagine what the storming of a city was like. Everything died. The only thing that was taken is what was valuable for slavery or monetary use or on and on. Now, in verse 13 and following is a very interesting phrase. All through the Old Testament in previous studies, I have always found a place for the idea of the remnant, that God always has a faithful remnant. But I want to tell you, the book of Jeremiah has convinced me there came a time in Israel's history when there was not a faithful remnant in Jerusalem. Now, there was in, in Judah because Jeremiah was there, and I'm sure he had some supporters, though not many. But I want to tell you, in Jerusalem, is not one man, they said. And listen to what God says about this idea of the remnant and the total destruction coming. Verse 13, I will surely snatch them away. It's a possibility. The word means to gather them declares the Lord, there will be no grapes on the vine and no figs on the fig tree and the leaves will wither and what I have given them shall pass away. Now, this, I think it goes back to Isaiah chapter 5 where Israel and Judah are pictured as God's special vineyard. He bought the best plants. He plant, got the best land. He dug irrigation ditches. He built up walls to keep out the predators. He put in a huge vat ready for the produce of the field. And for all the good he did, he got stinking sour wild grapes. Now, what he's saying to Israel here is, you're my vineyard and you've turned so completely to me that there's not going to be one grape left unpicked. One fig left unpicked. Even the leaves are going to fall off. Every leaf is going to fall off. The idea is total, complete, Destruction, annihilation of the kingdom of Judah is coming. Now, the little difficult little phrase here, and what I have given them will pass away, is very ambiguous in Hebrew. You just look at your English translations, they'll every one differ. I personally think, because this allusion is repeated earlier in chapter 6, verse 9, uh, Israel is considered to be a garden again. And Jeremiah, God telling Jeremiah says, Go through carefully every vine and pick every grape. That when it says, pass them over again, that's the word that's used to pass over that vine again and get every grape. So I think it's related to 6 and 9. And uh, I think English translations just don't know what to do with it, so they don't do anything with it. Now, in verse 14 is uh, beginning of another paragraph. Why are you sitting still? 
Assemble yourselves. Let us go into the fortified cities. The reason that the cities had such big walls, and you can't imagine the walls of these cities. You know, when you go to Jerusalem, you see that wall, you think, oh, what a beautiful wall. That wall wasn't built in this time. It was built during the Crusades and later than that even. So it's an Arabic wall in Jerusalem. But Lachish, uh, the city just outside of Jerusalem, about 30 miles, I think, had a wall 29 feet thick. 29 feet thick. And how high? We're not sure. But high, enough to keep people out. That's the kind of protection these wall cities were supposed to afford. But what happened is when an enemy came, everybody ran into those cities. Lack of water, lack of food, overcrowding, uh, unsanitary conditions. And so that's what's happening here. Now, notice where it says, And let us perish there, because the Lord our God has doomed us and given us poison water to drink. Well, that's an unfortunate English translation. This is the word water of gall, or gall of water. If you have a reference Bible, you might see the number of times it's used. It's used a whole bunch in the Bible. It's usually translated bitterness or wormwood. It's not poison. It's just extremely bitter. Okay? For we have sinned against the Lord. We waited for peace, but no good came. For a time of healing, but behold, terror. And notice where it says, From Dan is heard the snorting of horses. Why Dan? Why Dan? Farthest most north. Remember Dan's a funny little thing. Dan has a tribal inheritance down close to Judah. But if you remember back in the book of Joshua, what she did was she had this southern tribal location, but it wasn't good enough, so she took about half her men, trekked way up to the north, and captured a city up there. So she has two inheritances, one in the far north and one down in the southern part. Now, this remember in the book of Revelation when we... Uh, Read and I forgot what chapter. I think it's 16. But anyway, we read the list of the uh, uh, 12 tribes and Dan is left out and Ephraim and Manasseh as well as Joseph are all included. Now, it's been a real question of interpreters. Why was Dan left out in the book of the Revelation? I think it was left out to show that it's not talking about the literal 12 tribes but the symbolic nature of the people of God. But Irenaeus, an early church father, begin the interpretation that you've probably heard that from this particular verse in the Septuagint, which is available in English translation if you ever want it. Winston can get it for you. <laughs> he got the idea that from Dan would come the Antichrist. And the Septuagint translates this. From Dan is heard the snorting of horses, the, the sound of names, uh, uh, steeds, Instead of they will come, he, he interprets it that Dan will come. And so they ch he changes this verse, well, at least the Septuagint does, to infer that the enemy is going to come out of Dan instead of through Dan. And this is the place the tradition started that the Antichrist would come from the tribe of Dan. It's from the Septuagint of this verse. That's free to those who give the cooperative program. Now in verse 17. <laughs> for behold, I am sending serpents against you, adders, for which there is no charm, and they will bite you, declares the Lord. Now, where have you heard serpents coming? God sending serpents. Don't tell me the raiders of the lost ark. <laughs> Numbers 21. The people griped and balked, and God sent the fiery serpents. This, this may be an allusion to that, but anyway, they're... They're out going to try to pick the produce of the land, and the snakes are going to be there. And they're going to bite them. And that no one can charm them. Charming a snake is an interesting thing. Snakes don't have ears. And so a flute to charm a snake is a little dumb. Some think it's the movement of the flute. Some think it's the high-pierced sounds. They think snakes can hear maybe the high-pitched vibrations. But there are people in the Orient, and they're, apparently they were known in, in Jeremiah's day, who has the ability to calm a snake so it won't strike. There's even traditions about folks who could go into a house and know if there's a snake in the wall and charm it and bring it out. <laughs> be worth his weight in gold around my house, I want to tell you. you find snakes. Um, now, some think that verse 18 goes up. My sorrow is beyond healing, but the Hebrew there is a bit ambiguous. Even in my translation, it says, so Greek and versions. The Hebrew there implies... They will bite you, and there will be no healing. You see, in the wilderness, 
there was a snake that was lifted up on a staff, right? They could look to that snake and live by faith. But what God's saying is they're going to bite you and there's no snake to look at. Death sentence. Okay. Uh, my, now, now, in the second part of verse 18, I want you to catch the anguish of the heart of the prophet Jeremiah. This was not a man who said, ha ha. If you're, sometimes uh, I've listened to television shows or sermons where I kind of thought that the guy who was speaking for God kind of enjoyed the punishment that was going to come. He, you know, he got so much into God's going to get you that he really kind of got a kick out of it. Well, Jeremiah is not like that at all. He's not one to say, boy, sick him. He's one that loved his people but was committed to God. And here God had given him a message of doom and destruction, a hard message. And oh, how Jeremiah loved the people and loved the land. And he was caught between the two. And every now and then, it almost like the psychology of that tension just erupts in his personality. And here it, here it comes. Here's the preacher overwhelmed with the message. My heart is faint within me. Behold, listen, the cry of the daughter, my people, from a distant land. Is the Lord not in Zion? Is her king not within her? Why have they provoked me with their graven images and foreign idols? Now, here's one of the unusual times in the Bible. Now, the theology of God as king is pretty much all the way through the Old Testament. But here's one of the rare places where it's mentioned that the Lord, Yahweh, the covenant name for God, is considered the king of his people. Okay? They're saying, Isn't, aren't we God's people? Isn't this God's land? Don't we have God's laws? Isn't there a purpose for us existing? And then God says, If that's true, why have you turned so against me? Every one of you. And then he picks back up. The harvest is past. The summer is ended. And there's two harvests in Israel. One comes after Pentecost. It's the barley harvest or the grain harvest. Okay? Remember the waving of the first sheets on Resurrection Sunday? But later in the summer, the fruit ripens. Figs. All the rest of the fruit. Dates. So even if it was no rain and you lost the grain harvest, there was still possibility for food in the fruit harvest. So maybe this has been a proverb when it's saying, the harvest is past, the grain harvest is gone. April, May. And now the summer is gone. The fruit harvest is also past, and there is no food. Famine is the only prospect. Uh, and we are not saved. Now, that's not the spiritual sense. That's the physical sense. Okay? Remember the Old Testament word for deliverance, salvation, is, is, is used differently in the Old Testament than the New. For the brokenness of the daughter, my people, I am broken. I mourn. Dismay has taken hold of me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then has not the health of the daughter, my people, been restored? Gilead is on the eastern side of the Jordan River, north of the Sea of Galilee, and it was a, a well-wooded uh, kind of place. And the resin from the trees in that area, they made a distilled a balm that was world famous that everybody tried to get for medicinal purposes. And so what the, what the prophet is saying is, they got the medicine. They've got the physician, meaning God. But they won't use either one. The cure was there. The cure was there. The motive to be cured was not there. Therefore, they died. And they died tragically and horribly and in ways you can't imagine. Questions or comments about chapter 8? Lord, I thank you tonight for a, a time to look at Jeremiah. I think, Lord, what always impresses me about the man is his love for you, his love for the people, and yet the very difficult message he had to proclaim. Lord, help us to be faithful to your word and your book, no matter how difficult the message may be to swallow. 
Lord, we pray that we would not just say peace and security, that we would really search our lives and hearts, that we might have our peace and security in your righteousness and justice and not in our own. We pray for our land, Lord, that you would not let our land be characterized by a land where there is no one that does justice nor loves you can be found anywhere. Lord, we thank you for the prophet. We know that in many ways he relates to our own day with the message. We look forward to meeting him face to face when we see you. We thank you for his faithfulness. Pray for the faithfulness of others in our day who speak for you. Lord, help us, we pray, not to be so comfortable with the message, but to realize that you speak a message of judgment to every one of our lives, that we never reach a place that a message of judgment is not appropriate for areas of who we are. Forgive us when we think that everything is all right. Help us to be receptive to your message, wherever it may come from. In Jesus' name, amen.